Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining our Q2 results presentation. Uh, we are very pleased to be able to make this presentation, which is available on our website. Um, but Mark and I will just run you through what we consider to be the pertinent and, and uh, very, very successful points uh, uh, achieved through the, through the quarter. Um, as usual, the disclaimer is, uh, is there for, for, your, for your reading. Um, and moving on from there, just to re-emphasize uh, Caledonia and the blanket focus at the moment, uh, our Central Shark project is completed and we are in the process of ramping up production to 80,000 ounces in 2022. And we have reiterated our guidance for 2021 of 61 to 67,000 ounces. Obviously, higher production will result in a, a higher cash generation and that will enable us to, uh, to achieve our commitment of returning cash to shareholders via our dividend policy, which has been demonstrated by regular quarterly increases in dividends. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, we spoke uh, in, in a previous presentation that uh, we are still committed to looking for new opportunities in Zim. And uh, that continues to be an area of focus for us now that the Central Shaft project is uh, completed. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later. I'll now go into the highlights of, uh, of the actual second quarter. And uh, we don't achieve uh, good financial results if we don't get a good operating result. And very pleased to see that uh, the mine had a, uh, a record production quarter in terms of tons, over 165,000 tons, which resulted in 16,700 ounces, which is a, is a record for a second quarter at the mine. Um, that's 24% higher than the same time of last year. Uh, the, the revenue, because we were uh, lucky to have a higher gold price, 31 odd percent higher. Um, and most importantly, the EBITDA, the adjusted EBITDA, which takes out the, um, the unusual anomalies that occurred in the quarter, uh, like the, the write-off of the, the Glen Hume expense, which Mark will talk about a little bit later, um, we achieved a over a 100% increase in this adjusted EBITDA, $14 million for the quarter, from a comparable $6.9 million. And that's a, that's a really important uh, indication of the success and the health of this business. Um, the adjusted earnings per share, I also think is, uh, is a very, very uh, uh, good number for us to be proud of. 62.6 .6 cents per share being a 70% increase on the, on the comparable quarter. And considering uh, that Caledonia is paying 13 cents a quarter on its current dividend, this 62 odd cents a quarter indicates the, the strength of the business and our ability to look after shareholders on a, on a go forward basis. And the bottom line uh, that, that, uh, that uh, from a shareholder perspective is the dividends that are declared, uh, 12, 12 uh, uh, cents declared from, from a second quarter point of view compared to the seven and a half cents of the uh, comparable quarter. Um, just to explain uh, on, the, on the six month scenario, you're seeing we've got 23 cents for 2021 and 23 and a half cents for 2020. Please, uh, uh, for administrative purposes and regulatory purposes, the 2020 number uh, has got three dividends in it that were declared. And the 2021 number has only got two dividends declared in it. That's why uh, there's no there's no decline in dividend. It's just uh, from a from a regulatory point of view. In 2020, what would have been declared in July had to be declared right at the end of uh, of June. So, bit of an elaborate explanation, but that's why that number um, is is different. Um, I'm going to hand over to Mark now so he can take us through through the principle of the dividend and the financial results. So uh, thank you, Mark. Over to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, just just reiterating this point on, on the dividend that Steve was making. We've, we've had a, a series of unbroken quarter-on-quarter uh, -quarter increases in dividend declarations and payments by about one cent a quarter. Uh, and the only, the only interruption we had on that was in the 
in sort of April, May 2020, when we, we paused the rate of dividend, dividend growth, just so we could take stock of the, of the effect of coronavirus. And having, having seen that it had no effect, we, we held the dividend steady at seven and a half, and then thereafter we've increased it. Um, at a rate of one cent a quarter. That put us on a, a yield of about 4.1% um, as at the 5th of August. Uh, our share price has been adversely affected by some of the erratic movements in the gold price in recent days. And so no doubt that yield is now somewhat higher. But that's an 89% increase in the quarterly dividend since um, October 2019. Just very briefly on operations, here you see for each quarter the uh, tons milled and grade and the ounces produced in the recovery. and. Uh, Safe to say that uh, the second quarter, as well as being a, a record production in terms of uh, gold for any, any, second, any second quarter, we're now beginning to make progress in terms of increasing the, um, the tons milled. And so it's a record, a record quarter for any quarter in terms of tons milled. And that shows a very pleasing progress um, towards us achieving our 80,000 ounce a year target from 2022 onwards. And as disclosed in the, in the MDNA, production in July was just a fraction less than um, 6,000 ounces which again shows further progress towards achieving that, um, that run rate of 80,000 ounces a quarter. Okay, very quickly running through the, the financials, there's lots of numbers here. Um, revenue, as Steve's mentioned, was up um, as a result of the higher, uh, higher production and the higher gold price. The royalty <coughs> stays the same at 5%. A bit more information on production costs later on, but in general, production costs were, um, were less than we'd expected with the, with the exception of electricity. Uh, where we, we had to use the, the diesel generators more than expected because of difficulties with the local power. Um, don't forget, that as we've now commissioned the uh, central shaft, we now start to depreciate that. And so that's why uh, the depreciation charge for the quarter goes up from about 1.1 million to 2.2. So depreciating that central shaft will cost about $4 million a year of incremental uh, depreciation. So gross profit was very strong, uh, up from 9.2 in the comparable quarter to just under 14. Um, uh, GNA up slightly uh, from 1.3 million to 1.7, and that reflects uh, the <coughs> some some new new hires. Uh, the in uh, Johannesburg for on a technical basis, uh, also an internal audit person and uh, a, an IR person as well. Then below that, uh, foreign exchange gains and other income and expense. That's really where we the the earnings for this quarter are quite badly affected because in the in the comparable quarter, the, the, the first and second quarter of 2020, as the local currency devalued very, very, very swiftly, we realized some quite substantial foreign exchange gains. So $1.5 million in the first quarter of 2020, and nearly $4 million in the first half of 2020. But as the, as the rate of the local currency devaluation has, has more or less stopped, um, those gains have now, have now pretty much stopped. Those, those gains have stopped, and actually we've incurred modest losses in the quarter. Then the other thing to note is that um, other income and expense. Uh, last year we had net other income of one and a half million for, for the first for, for the second quarter of 2020, uh, and 3.2 million for the first half of 2020. And that reflects the um, export incentive credit that we were earning at that time, which has since been discontinued. Correspondingly, in in this quarter, 2021. Um, we incurred a three and a half million dollar impairment on the on the Glen Hume asset. The exploration work that we've done over the over the course of the last six months shows there is gold there, but ins insufficient in terms of grade and uh, and uh, width to make the the asset viable for us. So rather than put further money into that, we decided to to walk away from it, and we will not be exercising the option. So as a result of the of the reversal of the foreign exchange gains and the and the um, the higher and, and the impairment, that means that profit before tax uh, for the quarter was seven point seven million compared to nine point nine for the comparable quarter. Unfortunately, the um, the tax the overall tax charge uh, is is quite high. It's the effective tax rate of fifty one percent, and I'll get I've got more detail on the on the uh, on tax uh, in a moment. But the, the fundamental reason is that the profit before tax was adversely affected in the quarter by the three and a half million dollar impairment of um, of Glen Hume, but there was no corresponding tax benefit from that because the the company that owned Glen Hume has has no tax base. So IFRS profit for the quarter uh, was three point eight million. Uh, but if you look on a um, on an adjusted on an adjusted basis, as Steve's already mentioned, so stripping out uh, a foreign exchange gains and losses, deferred tax, and asset impairments, 
uh, actually is the, the core business earnings per share for the core business increased from 36.8 cents for the second quarter of 2020 to six, just under 63 cents for this quarter. So quite a creditable performance. A bit more information here on production costs. Um, as I've said, everything everything was, was, was very much in line with our expectations other than electricity, uh, which increased from 2.1 million in the second quarter of uh, 2020 to 2.7 million. And that's due to, to the increased use of the diesel generators. So I think in, in the second quarter of this, of this year, the, the, the gen sets ran for about five five and a half thousand hours uh, compared to about three and a half thousand hours in the comparable quarter. GNA, um, GNA in, in most areas, GNA remains remains uh, suppressed because we're not able to do travel and things like that. Um, you can see that employee costs increased from 0.7 million in the uh, second quarter of 2020. To about 1.1 million in this quarter and that's as a result of the increase in headcount we've taken on some specialized uh, technical staff in Johannesburg we've taken on um, an internal audit person in Johannesburg and also we've we've, we've taken on a uh, uh, an IR professional as well so as we increase the the scope of our business we are having to to play to a different set of rules and, uh, and we are having to staff ourselves accordingly and all of that translates to uh, an online cost per ounce and an all in sustaining cost uh, as shown here. Um, in, the, in the second quarter, the, the online cost per ounce was $715 an ounce, which is uh, below our guidance range of $740 to $815. And similarly, the all in sustaining cost of $933 was again below our, uh, our guidance range of $985 to $1,080. And a large proportion of our costs are fixed. And so, as we expect, the, uh, the second, second half of the year to be a better production half than the, the first half, that should, should mean that we continue to see, um, see uh, costs um, coming down. So we, we, I'm expecting that we will be within our, um, within our guidance range. I mentioned tax. Um, the overall tax, tax charge was, was three, just under $3.9 million. Uh, the bulk of that is um, income tax in Zimbabwe, uh, which are 2.4 million, uh, and deferred tax of about 1.2 million. Uh, and then on top of that, we also have uh, income tax in South Africa, which arises on um, intercompany profits, and then uh, withholding tax as we, as we move money around the group. So whilst the, the overall aggregate tax charge was about 51%, if you just look at the, the Zimbabwe income tax and the Zimbabwe deferred tax, and express that as a percentage of gross IFRS profit, which, which relates pretty closely to the online profit before tax, um, that's an effective tax rate of about 26%, uh, which, is, which is within a percent or two of the, of the overall headline um, income tax rate in Zimbabwe. So I think that should give you some comfort that whilst the, at first blush, the tax charge looks high, actually it, it's rooted in some sort of um, commerciality. Looking at cash flow. Um, cash flow before working capital uh, was, was $13.7 million for the quarter compared to nine and a half for the previous quarter. This quarter, we, we benefited from a, um, a reduction in working capital by about 1.3 million, which reverses a trend we've seen in, uh, in recent quarters. And so the, um, at the end of the last quarter, we were carrying quite a large um, uh, receivable position uh, as a result of, of delayed payments to the, uh, to, the, to the refinery, which meant that at the end of that quarter, we had quite a large amount owing to us. That unwound within the, the first few weeks of, um, of this quarter uh, and hence contributed to the, uh, to the overall reduction in, work, in working capital. So net cash from operating activities. Uh, there's $12.7 million for the quarter compared to only $4 million for the, um, for the comparable quarter in 20, 2020. Investing, we still continue to invest heavily. So we're still investing $7 million in the quarter. Uh, that's primarily a blanket. Uh, and that is, the, uh, the, that is now having completed the and commissioned the shaft. Uh, the vast bulk of that now is the, uh, is the horizontal development we're pressing ahead with so to be able to achieve that um, increased production of 80,000 ounces a year. So cash was very strong. Balance sheet doesn't really take much talking to. The, the gold ETF that we were holding uh, in previous quarters to where we were parking some surplus cash in South Africa in gold uh, rather than holding it in, um, in South African rands and making it subject to, um, to rand devaluation, we realized that 
in the quarter and remitted those proceeds back to uh, back to Jersey. And the, the liabilities, the non-current liabilities um, and the current liabilities, that's mainly deferred tax, rehab provisions and trade payables. We, we don't have debt. We've only got about $200,000 worth of, um, of locally denominated debt in Zimbabwe for, um, for sort of um, working capital purposes. So that's the end of um, that's the end of the financial review. I'll hand back to Steve to talk about uh, opportunities in Zimbabwe. Thank you, Mark. And uh, as you will have seen, a very very commendable set of results. And um, you know, we look forward to to the next uh, few quarters uh, uh, of similar success. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the the additional opportunities that we identified in um, in Zimbabwe. Mark has already explained that uh, we are not going to proceed with the Glen Hume property, so I'll focus on the Connemara North property. Um, we've got uh, an option taken in, in December of last year, valid for about 18 months for us to do some exploration. And uh, we have not, uh, we've not turned drills there yet because we've been doing desktop work on, on the project, but we're about to start that, so, so that is exciting. The option price there will be will be an additional $5 million if we decide to exercise. So that evaluation work uh, will take place as per um, the, nor the normal process. Um, we believe that this is a prospective area, um, but uh, the nature of exploration, uh, it, listeners will understand, is high risk. And uh, we, we must ensure that before we exercise that this project meets the hurdles that we set for ourselves in terms of a project of this nature. So we will report back as and when appropriate and let you know how that goes. Um, that, that is a project we have in hand at the moment. We continue to look for additional projects in Zimbabwe and elsewhere. Um, because we are committed to adding to our pipeline of uh, projects for Caledonia so that we, we move away from just being a single asset blanket mine operation. So that makes uh, the, the future exciting for us. Moving off uh, those opportunities onto our ESG uh, commitment, we recently published our inaugural uh, ESG report we're very pleased to have been able to do that um, and understanding that uh, this is a very important topic for stakeholders. Um, the report is comprehensive, uh, but readers will understand that uh, we, we are coming from, from a, a no reporting base into the, the reporting realm. Um, but what is clear from the preparation of this report is that a lot of the uh, concepts of ESG have been practiced for many, many years at Blanket. Uh, and all we're doing now is just to formally um, uh, document them uh, and importantly, put in various controls and data collection mechanisms, which will enable the quality of our reporting to improve on a year on year basis. So I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that report. It's, uh, it tells us, it tells you really what the ethos and the, the DNA of, of this business is. And uh, we're very proud to have put that, uh, that ESG report out. Looking, uh, looking to the, the, the hot topic of, of the last year, year and a bit, COVID, pleased to announce that uh, COVID uh, was, was, very, was very live in, in Zimbabwe, but it had no disruptive effect on our, our production since inception of sort of March 2020. Um, we have endured numerous lockdowns on a national basis and a regional basis and on a basis where South Africa was locked down. And uh, as listeners are familiar, a lot of the consumables and capital items we use come from Zimbabwe. We have managed our way through that and uh, the operating guys have done an excellent job in keeping the mine uh, running. We haven't made as many donations through the Chamber of Mines uh, this year as we did last year because uh, we put infrastructure in. We did uh, enormous amount of, of help for communities and, and the Chamber in Zim. But importantly, we continue to provide all the support that our workers and their families need. Um, we currently are in a third wave in Zimbabwe. 
So there are very strict controls of movement in and out of the property to protect our business and our workers and their families, which is of paramount importance to us. We've had more cases in the third wave than we've had before. But as I've said already, we have weathered the storm and uh, we have managed our way through. Um, and uh, I, can, I can tell you as we are today, the, the number of active cases on the mine are declining quite uh, significantly. Uh, but we will continue to be very diligent and uh, watch the, the COVID uh, conditions very, very closely. Uh, from a vaccination point of view, we have procured uh, enough vaccines to vaccinate all of our staff and their dependents in the village. And uh, we are rolling that out uh, as, uh, as aggressively as possible with education programs to try and get um, people to, to take up the, the vaccine, which obviously is on a voluntary basis, but we know it is the right thing to do. So that is, that is our results presentation. Uh, that gives you a good picture of, of how we have done. Uh, Q3 and Q4 is uh, the period where we need to ramp up production to get us to a run rate uh, towards the end of the year which replicates what we will need for 2022 to achieve our 80,000 ounces. So I would hope that you can look forward to some uh, good, in, good uh, reports coming out of us from a production perspective. And uh, also, as ever, watch out for the regular quarterly dividend uh, announcements. And uh, I'll just take that opportunity to, to thank you for listening. And thanks, Mark, for, for your presentation and preparation uh, for, for our shareholders. So once again, thank you until we chat again. Thanks a lot. Bye.